Welcome to 30 Minute Talk. And today is uh, my name is Dr. Andy Nazarchuk. This is our 30th program of 30 Minute Talks. And today we have a wonderful speaker from France who's going to Dr. Frederic Bouchon, a social sciences researcher from the Institute of Paul Bacuse. And we are looking forward to hearing about fine dining. We'll introduce Frederic in a little bit. Uh, but first, we have our founders. Uh, Perry, why don't you say hello to the crowd? Well, good afternoon, although it's looking rather dark here in Malaysia behind me, but in fact, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you might be. It's great that we've got another fascinating, wonderful, exciting show lined up for you today with uh, my former colleague, Frederick, uh, who I worked with for many years here in Malaysia. So I'm really pleased he's been able to join us this week. Andy. Alan, and well, and well Alan, where are you, Alan? What are you, where are you reporting from today? I'm reporting from Perth, Western Australia, everybody. So uh, not not from the Sydney Harbour Bridge, as you might see in the background. But once again, uh, we, we're enjoying some really good weather. Um, we're fortunate that things have settled down somewhat in Australia in terms of COVID. And like uh, Andy and Perry, really looking forward to uh, the presentation today, Frederick. Um, food's dear to all of us. And, and in fact, uh, uh, for, for most of us, we, we, we've come from a food background in the hospitality industry. So we look forward to... Um, some of the latest information that you're going to be sharing with us today. And Frederick, where, where are you reporting from today, Frederick? Hi, Andy. I'm reporting from France. I'm based in Lyon today. And today is uh, now is morning time in, in Europe. Well, it's it's uh, it's a, it's everybody. We always have different hours for everyone here. Uh, and again, Alan, Alan, maybe once you can help us to so thanking our academic partners today. We have so many academic partners, and we also are going to be announcing a new academic partner today. Alan, absolutely. Thanks, Andy. And as everybody knows, uh, without academic partners, thirty-minute uh, talks cannot take place. So once again, can we just thank all of our academic partners? Uh, we've got the Macau Tourism and Hospitality Association. Uh, we've got CoREP, the Council of Hotel Restaurant uh, Educators of the Philippines, Silver Mountain, University of the Bahamas, the ICE, uh, the Schidler, the School of Travel Industry Management, University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, we've got uh, LPU, we've got UST, uh, we've got uh, Joji's International Schools, we've got Sunway University, we've got uh, National Kaohsiung University of Hospitality and Tourism, uh, Tourism Industry Board, TIPFI, PARTA, the Asia Pacific, the Asia Pacific Cree, and of course, Hosco is as another partner. Did I miss anybody there? No, I think oh, and Ga Mahatma Gandhi University. Thank you very much uh, to all of our academic partners. And we have, we have so many, and we, and we do have a new academic partner today. We're happy to announce that Holy Cross College from the Philippines uh, has joined us, and they have, a, they have actually several campuses, so I put on the hospitality department as Concepcion Holy Cross College, and when I was looking at their website, I saw this picture of all their very good-looking students, so I decided to put this one on there. Even though they're not hospitality students, I said that if, the, if these students are as good-looking, I'm sure the hospitality students are even better looking. So welcome to our new academic partner from Holy Cross. And as always, at the beginning of at each show, we, uh, we create a 90 seconds uh, video. And today's uh, 90 second video is created by Alan Williams. And we try to share an interesting topic or some uh, point that we want our students to know. So let's uh, shut off our videos for a second and we'll let, uh, let uh, Alan show, get, do his 90 seconds. Everybody ready? Here we go. I'm Alan Williams and welcome to another 90 seconds. As the world continues to face the challenge of coming to terms with the impact of the coronavirus, stress, anxiety and mental health is emerging as a major concern across communities throughout the world. So today I'm going to share with you the tips and the tricks that the World Health Organization recommends, and these are to assist you coping with the stress and the anxieties that you may be feeling. Pause, breathe, reflect. Take some slow breaths in through your nose and then slowly breathe out. Slow breathing is one of the best ways to lower stress because it signals to your brain to relax your body. Connect with others. Now more than ever, talking to people you trust can help. Keep in regular contact with people close to you. Tell them how you are feeling and share any concerns that you or they may have. Keep to a healthy routine. Things you should be doing include, get up and go to bed at similar times every day, keep up with your personal hygiene, eat healthy meals at regular times, exercise regularly, and doing just three or four minutes of light intensity walking or stretching will help you. Allocate time for working and time for resting and make time for doing the things that you enjoy. Things that you should not be doing, don't use alcohol and drugs as a way of dealing with fear, anxiety, boredom and social isolation. Be kind to yourself and to others 
and don't expect too much of yourself on the days you're feeling stressed. Accept that some days you may be more productive than others. Try to reduce how much you watch, read or listen to the news that makes you feel anxious or distressed. And helping others can also be good for you too. If you're able to, offer support to people in your community who may need it. And finally, reach out for help if you do need it. A good place to start is your local health worker and helplines can be also a good source of support. By following these simple tips, you can certainly find ways to reduce stress and anxiety in these extraordinary times. Thank you for watching another 90 seconds and keep safe, everybody. That's a very, ti a very timely topic, Alan. I think we all are under a little stress. The US is going through the election process as we speak. Uh, Europe is having some issues. The world is still suffering under the pandemic, but we all have to keep our, take care of ourselves during these, these trying times. So thank you very much for that wonderful 90 seconds. And today, um, the topic today I think we should maybe have a workout each week now. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> I, I out. But, uh, you know, today's topic will help you a little bit because, as Alan mentioned, eat healthy. So today I know the, the topic will fit into that topic very well. Uh, gastronomic destination challenges and future. Uh, we have our guest speaker today, and we're very happy. Uh, Perry, I know you know you know our guest speaker. We both work together with him at uh, Taylor's University in Malaysia, uh, Dr. Frederick Bruchon, who is a social sciences researcher and scholar from the Institute of Paul Bacuse, which is one of the famous hospitality schools in the world, and founding member of the ASEAN Tourism uh, Research Association, which is a very popular a uh, forum for all researchers in tourism and hospitality around the region. Uh, and we know that today when he's going to talk about fine dining in a time of crisis and fear, and that, and that is true. I think the restaurant industry around the world has been affected in every country, and we're looking forward to hearing from Frederick to tell us about fine dining during this pandemic. Per Frederick, we're going to turn, turn it over to you right now. And, you, and we're looking forward. Perry, why don't you, why don't you say hello to, to Frederick since you know him from? Well, I just would like to, again, extend a great welcome. I've worked with Frederick for many years and uh, he's had a lot of experience in Asia and uh, now has returned back home to France. And, you know, France has got such a reputation as a culinary country. And I think sharing some of the uh, trends that's coming out and the issues that we've been seeing in France. So, Frederick, wonderful to, fantastic to welcome you to 30 Minutes Talk. Wonderful to have you here. So, um, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of you. And uh, so I, I will start my presentation. I think you can all see this presentation. So today the topic is about gastronomic destinations and all these challenges and uh, current situations, especially related to, to, to the crisis, the sanitary crisis we are all facing and the impacts they have on the restaurants and tourism and hotel industries. So let's take a look at all the, the, the current challenges. It's very much the, the, the industry is affected because a lot of uh, establishments are closed and uh, so a lot of people uh, cannot work, people cannot go to restaurants and people cannot also travel. And all this is very much interrelated. So it's what we're gonna try to, to, to address uh, in this short presentation. Uh, having this common denominator of food, food in terms of restaurant consumption and food also in terms of destinations because all work together and that's very much what is the, the, the the, the issue today. Uh, I, I will give you a very much uh, uh, perspective from where I'm located now. I, I spent many years in Asia, but now I'm back in, uh, in France. And because today uh, France is still under lockdown and there's a lot of cases. So I, I, I tweak a bit my, my presentation towards this angle, but a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of examples and a lot of cases actually can, can be um, extended to the rest of the world. So let's let me first take you to, to one big question that we of, often have is is it do we live to eat or do we eat to live? And that's a very philosophical question. You we all have different answers, and I think it is also very much related to where we, we live, because sometimes the, the, the preoccupation will be more on, on the on, on the art of eating and sometimes more on the art just of living and where uh, the eating part becomes secondary. And it depends also on, on certain ages of, of uh, that we, we go through. So, but anyhow, food is very much an expression of our own identity and culture in the place we, we live, the place we were born perhaps as well. And it's also, uh, 
often uh, a key defining factor to 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 illustrate a, a place. And when it comes to tourism, it's also a, a good uh, match between the destination and the culture through this uh, prism of um, of food. And by the way, UNESCO uh, in its World Heritage uh, list also incorporates food as one of the tangible and intangible element of its uh, denomination, meaning that it's recognized also uh, as a key uh, identity and cultural element of any society. When we come to tourism, uh, most of tourists will dine for leisure because when we travel, we seldom have time to cook, so we, we go and patronize different establishments, but also when we are on uh, our daily life, and I think what the, the small survey that was just conducted before we started the show uh, indicated the, the different uh, perceptions towards uh, dining out or eating at home. And I'm going to show you a bit the different uh, areas of the world and the different uh, relationship to, 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 to the fact of dining out. When it, some countries uh, have more than 50% of meals taken in restaurants. So I'm not talking about fine dining, it can be any type of restaurant, but it's very prevalent, it's, it's, it's very common to, to eat out, either because it's cheap, it's convenient, it's, or there's no other choice, but all these uh, are, are, are very, uh, specific to, to some regions of the world. For example, in Southeast Asia, it's very um, often that people eat out for and sometimes for many meals in, in a day. In, in North America as well. Uh, when we move to other regions of the world, we can see some differences like UK, Italy. It's about one third of the time or even less people uh, uh, take their meals in restaurants. And in that, uh, in that uh, statistics, we include also the, when, when we eat while we are working for, for, for lunch or if we eat in a cafeteria, all these type of, uh, of um, restaurant uh, patronizing are, uh, are uh, included in this, uh, in this survey. Uh, some countries like France or Spain, it's very, actually quite rare to, to take meals in restaurant. Although it's quite, it's quite uh, ironic because there are many restaurants, but people really go to restaurant more for special occasions or at least for uh, it, more in order to, 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 to enjoy the, 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 the dining activity. So that gives uh, an idea of how often people uh, go to, to, to restaurants. And I think in these days, uh, it's, uh, it has a big impact on our uh, practices uh, towards dining. And this is uh, also having an impact in the way we practice tourism. I was saying earlier that tourism and dining are very much uh, uh, interconnected. And that happens uh, in many denominations because when we talk about gastronomic tourism, we are not necessarily talking about fine dining. It can be any any type of, uh, of dining that goes from uh, hawker and uh, uh, stores or market uh, dining to uh, top restaurants, also farm stay. Some countries are very developed in, in agri-tourism agri as well, are going for artisan producers and going to, to driving, going through uh, wine or food trails, all these uh, are part of this gastronomic tourism, or we could say also food tourism. And that often defines the destination, this, uh, the, the food and the produces from the, the local uh, destinations create the, the sense of authenticity and identity of that place. And it's also uh, an important contributor to, to the um, decision to, to go for, for this particular destination. So actually, there are two types of destinations when we look at gastronomic destination. One might be more related to the fine dining experience, where actually the establishment becomes a, a destination per se. And the other one is more related to the region and the local produces that come from the agriculture or that region. So let's try to see what are these two uh, uh, type of destinations. So the first one is, uh, yeah, fine dining. So it's very much what we 
the when we talk about all the, the, the top restaurants and with star chefs that the, the names are famous like for example if you look at uh, french cuisine all these chefs are very much known they, they established many restaurants worldwide and they became brands by, by themselves so in that type of food destination people go to eat the cuisine of these chefs and they are recognized and they are very much uh, famed because of media attention and a lot of uh, TV channels are, are dedicated to, to this type of, uh, of um, gastronomy. And usually they are always anchored to a specific uh, terroir or t territory, but they are evolving towards more creative type of cooking, more fusion. So but they, they are uh, eventually becoming a destination uh, when people go and patronize their restaurant, they are really much uh, interested in dining at this uh, type of uh, famous uh, chef's restaurants. The second one is the destination that is linked to a terroir. So what is a terroir? Ter terroir is coming from the word territory. So actually to, to, to have a, a clear picture, and here you can think about your own uh, country or the country you are currently uh, residing and where there's an association between local products and a specific place. So th this connection defines a terroir. For example, if you are in a place uh, famous for a certain type of fruits, a certain type of dishes, that dish or that food becomes an identity definer of that place. And the association is very strong. And in terms of tourism, it helps to brand the, the territory. So let me give you some examples. For example, from uh, France once again, and here I show you a map of France. And you see this map of France is a cheese map of France. <laughs> so meaning that in France, it's supposed to be around 300 different types of cheese. And uh, each cheese is pretty much well known uh, in, in, in this country according to its name and not the, whether it's um, uh, cow milk or goat cheese, no, it's, the name itself comes from a specific place. And we know, for example, the, one of the most famous French cheese called Camembert comes from Normandy region. And so the association in, when people are familiar with this type of products is very strong. They, if they go to Normandy, they can expect a quality product and you can accept, expect a, a specific type of uh, landscape. On uh, um, or some, some other cheese that are quite famous as well, like blue cheese, Roquefort is very much from the Southwest. And it's also associated with a specific type of food and dining. So here I, I, I put as an example, a cheese map, but it could have been a wine map of, of a country or even fruit maps and all these different local agricultural products are also regulated. Is it what we call the AOP? Meaning that you can produce uh, this type of cheese only in a specific region. So it's like a government guaranteed quality uh, assurance process. And so it it's also helps to, to bring a specific brand to a specific territory. And that's why uh, often when we talk about uh, French food, uh, cheese and wine come as a defining elements of this culture. Let's now let's take a tour. I'm going to show you one example. So we're going to move to this uh, uh, city where I'm located uh, at, at the current time called the Lyon. And Lyon is, is considered the gastronomic capital of a country. So it means two things. And it's very much related to what we've seen earlier. One side is famous for its top star Michelin restaurants, and another part is famous for its terroir components. So in terms of uh, gastronomic tourism, it's about 8 million tourists, 1.5 uh, billion euros of revenue, about 20,000 jobs, and 2,000 restaurants in the inner city. So it means that it's a, quite a, an important a component of a local economy. And because of the current lockdown, it creates a lot of uncertainties and uh, worries for the future. But when we look at the, the, the destination, so we have the fine dining restaurants like Paul Bocuse, which is uh, one of the 
founding father of uh, contemporary French cuisine, uh, Ted Dua, which is a, a more uh, modern type of uh, fine dining. And then we have all the local products, either from the markets or from the shops, and also the more uh, simple uh, type of restaurants that are um, like most like street food, we could say. And on the other side, the Lyon uh, terroir is very much related to the hinterland, meaning the, the, the regions within a 45 minute drive from the city center. And it's quite diverse, which explains why the, the, the food is also diverse. There are vineyards about 30 kilometers from the city center with Beaujolais and Côte du Rhône. There are also a lot of uh, fish production because a lot of uh, small lakes and also all the mountain uh, uh, cheese and um, meat that comes from there and a lot of fruits as well. So all this is important as uh, gastronomic consumption, but it's also important for tourism because the tourism branding of that region is very much associated with these products. And the problem today faced by almost majority of countries is the, the current situation with uh, the lockdown. And you can see since uh, March, uh, it, it's been a, a huge drop in terms of uh, sales from the restaurant and FMB outlets. Uh, that's for Europe and North America. And that was up to August. But you can see that currently there's a, a second wave of uh, coronavirus in many countries. And so there's a new series of lockdowns. And we, now we are back to the same situation as in May. So it's about 80% drop from the regular uh, last year's uh, figures. So that's a, a big concern for, for many uh, operators because uh, if, they, if they can't uh, get revenue, it means that a lot of them will eventually have to uh, close down and what is expected is that actually perhaps 50% of restaurants might have a permanent closure because of a lot of cash flow issues and they can't uh, replay, uh, repay the loans despite the government uh, incentives. And uh, so, and the ongoing and the, the, the lengthy period of time to, to, to recover. So some have been quite um, innovative in raising more delivery or, or takeaway services, but it's still uh, quite uh, a big uh, question. Also, interestingly, the fine dining uh, industry, the top restaurants are the most exposed to, to are, are the most vulnerable because international travel restrictions. Uh, business tourists are huge components of this type of restaurants. And uh, because business tourists cannot travel, like leisure tourists, so it's it's a critical situation. A lot of palace restaurants are closed down. Uh, some some companies, like example Paris uh, Shangri La, you can see the picture here, is uh, closed down for good. It, it was a two-star Michelin restaurant, and Shangri La decided just to focus on the hospitality uh, and accommodation side and to let the, the FMB component uh, go. Yet there are some opportunities. As always, when there's a crisis, there are opportunities as well. So opportunities that actually emphasize an ongoing trend that was uh, happening in terms of technological uh, developments and also in terms of consumer and lifestyle uh, expectations. So all these have been accelerated through this crisis. So there are Opportunities also in terms of businesses, because if a lot of restaurants close down, we might expect some, um, some opportunities to, to, to take over, but we need the market to, to, to be back uh, on track. Uh, so in terms of lifestyle, there's a, a, a huge uh, turn in, in, in terms of demand for more healthy, more safe, more uh, easily tracked type of products. And uh, also the, the technology, the cooking technology shows a lot of possibilities. 
to, to produce like organic meat and all these uh, new possibilities that are also showing a potential shift in the, the way food is uh, uh, defined. Uh, so for, for example, what you can see on this picture, this one is agricultural trade show. Uh, and um, that was uh, the meat um, industry trying to, to promote uh, a more uh, friendly approach because of the demand for more vegetarian products. So they, they, they were advocating flexitarian um, uh, diet while still selling meat. But uh, you can see people were demonstrating because they were vegan people and trying to, to say it was a bit hypocritical uh, to, to, to promote meat and yet to promote vegetarianism. So that's a, a lot that shows a lot of the ongoing debate or discussion towards what is the, the, the ethical and healthy uh, food consumption. So when we look at the, the, the shoppers, uh, there are opportunities to reach out to the shoppers, uh, developing and proposing products that are more traceable, where we can really go from the farm to the table and really identify the, the different steps uh, of, of the products. Also, in terms of uh, knowing better the nutrition value of, of, uh, of the product, and this one, some countries are enforcing these labels where the, the consumer really knows how good or how bad is the product. Also, in terms of supply chain and delivery, making the online sales um, uh, very much widespread and uh, having restaurants that are very much engaged in this um, eco and organic and vegetarian um, definition. And that combined explains the, 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 the lifestyle trends where consumer really have this quest for health, wellness, and also the real thing. People are less and less uh, enticed towards uh, processed food or highly processed food. And they are really uh, expecting more uh, original and uh, natural products. The, the problem that is often mentioned is the cost because all these products are generally more expensive. So how to address that? How to address the, the need for quality product with an affordable uh, price for the consumer? So in terms of uh, quality products, uh, we can see a wide range of new products coming to, to a market where they really explain that it comes from uh, ethical uh, producers, ethical distributors, and also that the quality of the product itself is, uh, is here. Also, possibility to go direct into gardening or pick the, 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 the vegetable and fruits from, from the farm. All this helps. To, to reconnect to uh, this notion of terroir, uh, to, to, to go back to, to the territory, to, to, to the earth somehow. So an example in the combination of technology, innovation, quality products, and price is uh, in wine, for example. You can see it is a vineyard in the, in the southwest of France. And here is the example of this uh, wine that are sulfite free. So sulfites are, are used to stabilize the, 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 the wine in the bottle and to have a, a better conservation. But the problem is not very healthy, it gives headache and a lot of people are, are very um, uncomfortable when drinking wine because of that. So it's been a, a huge uh, shift in some producers uh, able to develop organic wine. And on top of that, organic wine that is also sulfite free. But it was very expensive because the labor, it takes more attention, and more care because you can't use uh, pesticides or any, uh, any uh, chemicals. But eventually now it's possible because of, of te technological improvement to create sulfite free uh, wine. And this is the example of Bordeaux wine. So Bordeaux wine is considered uh, quite a, a top wine usually and quite expensive. But you can see you can get now for five uh, or six euros an organic and sulfite free type of wine. 
so it's quite uh, it's starting to match the consumer's expectation with the, the possibility to have something quite affordable. And that takes us, we are still in the vineyard, but now we're gonna look at it from a tourism perspective, because we were talking about these changes in food. Sometimes it's, it's called slow food because we want food that is not processed, with food that comes directly from, from, the, from the farm. And uh, it's, it has derived also in a slow tourism. And this year was particularly um, obvious because of the lockdown. Most countries have seen a huge development of domestic tourism because we couldn't cross borders. And the main beneficiary were not the, the big metropolitan areas. It was more the rural areas because suddenly people wanted to, to be able to connect more with nature, to get away from this uh, lockdown situation where everybody is, is a bit prisoner from, from home and being able to uh, go back to the nature, go back to a slower mode. And that also shows a similar trend, or at least a parallel trend, where uh, there's a, a huge demand for a connection to the terroir. So, for example, cycle, uh, cycling, uh, boat or, or on canals or rivers, uh, hiking. So all this, what we call slow tourism, was very much favored. And a lot of destinations that are rural destinations in across Europe, but not only across Europe, uh, has uh, shown their, their best uh, tourism year ever because it was full, full of tourists. A lot of farm stay were, were full. You would want to rent bicycle, it was all taken, renting uh, canoes were all taken as well. So all these slow activities uh, were very popular. So that shows this, uh, this um, evolution of societies where people are expressing the desire to, to, to go direct to the real product, to be able to see the, the, the place of production and that enables this type of tourism. And also, to, to, to have opportunities for producers to directly um, sell their, their, their products and hence to have uh, f and activities on site. So there's uh, a trend that is quite, uh, that was ongoing, but I really believe has been accelerated uh, through the pandemic and is still uh, ongoing. Of course, when things will go back to normal, we can expect uh, a return to a, a more urban uh, type of activities and finding restraints should benefit uh, once again. But also uh, there's this possibility that uh, the demand for something more authentic or natural uh, continues for, for, for a long time. So that's what is expressed in terms of combining food terroir tourism. So for example, it's possible also to, to do like a, a grape picking for, for to help a producer, but it's also a, a whole experience because uh, it's a very social environment and meet uh, new friends and, and it's a very much a natural activity. So uh, some, a lot of people like it. Also cycling and going also from local restaurants to local restaurants are also uh, you see uh, using boats and discovering some some regions so this is this connection of food and terroir and some destinations uh, have benefited from here we can we could see that this type of tourism has has grown about 30 percent uh, this year and the emphasis is on this experience connecting back to to nature so that's something that is uh, uh, quite um, unique and that is very much uh, a reflection of the current situation. So the question yeah, we were asking is, is it gonna last? It will last uh, maybe in a minor mode, but the, the trend is, is already established. I've, I'm gonna stop here because I think time is uh, going fast. And thank you very much if you have any question of comment, you can always send me an email and uh, I'd be pleased to, to answer you back. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. And I think it was very, uh, very timely because uh, even Alan's presentation was sort of focused on health 
And food is one of those things that, you know, it goes back to your original question, do we live to eat or eat to live? I think a lot of people, because of our fast-paced society, have been eating just to live, you know, uh, but, you know, now I think people have to slow down. They have to be more mindful about their food choices. And what you described is, is actually happening because more people get to are looking for the source of their food. They want to know how it's produced. Isn't that true, Alan? Absolutely. Uh, um, uh, I guess um, for, for me, uh, you know, out of this pandemic, there, there's obviously a challenge for the, for the world to deal with. But it's really good to see that what you've, you've pointed out there is the opportunities that are coming out of what's happening in the food tourism industry. And you've given us a, a few good examples. I mean, um, connecting back to nature has been something that food industry has been, been wanting to deal with for some time. Is, is that you, you mentioned, um, for example, people going out and picking grapes, helping out in that space. I know in Western Australia where I live, there's, there's a shortfall of labor because uh, you know uh, the lack of backpackers traveling, for example, has there been yeah. some some sort of uh, feedback on that and how that's been used? Well, it, it yeah, it, it was the same thing because uh, a lot of time it was seasonal workers coming and uh, and because this time it was not possible to have workers from especially from North Africa, so it was it has been branded perhaps because of a situation by some wine uh, makers as come and help us, we need some help. Of course, we're gonna give you some, some, some pocket money, it's free accommodation, free food. And actually it was, uh, it was very much on the social media and it was a big hit because a lot of people were either on fellow scheme or anything and they, they, they were free. So they decided to, to come and help. So it was, I think it was like 100,000 uh, uh, volunteers to, to, to mm -hmm. when they, they called for, that was about two months ago when it was the harvest time. Huh. So that's why it uh, was something quite, uh, people were a bit like um, thinking, wow, that's actually, uh, because it was also interesting because it was all on social media. And these people were trapped in their apartment in big cities, wanted to escape. And that was like a free holiday somehow. Yeah. So that, that was, uh, I think they were very creative in, in trying to, to portray it in a very pleasant and uh, fun uh, activity. And that helped to serve the, 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 the harvest. Restaurants are closing and doing uh, delivery only and online sales. Do you see a big trend for, for, for more producers or more products to be sold direct to the customer and, and skipping the retail store? And, and you know, because the, they, they don't have the restaurants, so they, they are going, they're saying, we'll ship the food directly to your house. And, you, and I know in the U.S. they, they have people get a box and it has everything you need for a meal for two or three people and you open up the box and cook it is that happening in france yeah same thing yeah yeah i i, I saw that most of european countries where uh, first a uh, restaurant that couldn't uh, uh, have a dine-in service uh, did that because are out of uh, just to, to to survive and also producers, because some producers uh, used to do a uh, uh, producer's market, and that was barred also by, by, by the government. They couldn't have markets, uh -huh. so they, they, they realized they could deliver as well. And then they, 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 they would deliver a full basket of fruits or a, anything from, from their farm, and they realized actually the sales were better. <laughs> Instead uh, of waiting on the market for customers, because people don't don't go to market so much anymore, unless they are really hardcore in that, uh, in and they, they, they didn't have the time. And here, uh, so I think this one will, will continue because also the technology is quite accessible for 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 producers. And in the past, we were not thinking of that because their mind was full with their daily activities, and they they, they had time to to realize it was not so complicated to establish this type of delivery within a small radius. But otherwise, we use the delivery uh, platforms um, to, 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 to reach out to the customers. You know, uh, for Freddie, uh, you said you were, you said, I'll get a little feedback. Uh, tell, tell, me, tell me about your experience going back. You were in Malaysia for several years, and then you went back to France. What, what, what's the, what was the biggest difference, cultural difference, concerning your gastronomic experience between the two? Okay, uh, I think... Well, it's, it's very interesting because both countries are very much uh, food countries. People love food in Malaysia, people love food in France, but I think it's expressed differently. First, in, in terms of like uh, what, what, what I showed you uh, earlier on, uh, in terms of restaurant uh, 
uh, practices. Uh, in Malaysia, it's much more prevalent because we, we go for dining out almost every meal, except maybe breakfast, and even though, and uh, it was even at night, we could go out to, to, to dine because it was all the, the different stores open and, and so on. So it's, uh, um, and I, 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 so I think the, the, the notion of terroir I was expressing is a bit different in Malaysia and, and in Europe. In Malaysia, it's more about the, the dish itself, and the dish will be uh, related to a specific place. But actually, when we go through Southeast Asia, a lot of dishes are very similar, and it's just the ingredients that differentiate them from, from one, one another. Yeah. And then yeah. there's always a very strong, uh, I would say, almost a, a personal connection to, 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 to the dish and, and to the place as well. The, Perhaps one, uh, I know that some countries like Thailand have tried to connect one product and one village in order to, to build the brand more for tourism uh, purposes and at the same time to connect with uh, a better distribution of, of, uh, of uh, agricultural products. And I think that was a very good initiative because it helps it help, uh, to, 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 to reach two objectives in one. And Malaysia also mm -hmm. tried to, to do that, like example for Dorians. Some Dorians are very much connected to one place in Malaysia and uh, they, they are the top products if they come from that place. Right. So that, that's also this association that happens. Of course, cheese is absolutely out of context because uh, Malaysia is not uh, connected to, mm -hmm. to any dairy or, or cheese is not in the culture. But the culture will be also very much uh, towards fruits and uh, and so, some unspecific dishes as well. Yeah, Alan, one one. Alan, sorry, Andy. One one last question from you, and then we'll. Yeah, we'll... Sure, uh, we've. Uh, I was just going to say, there's some questions coming through from our uh, our audience. You've you've generated some real interest there, uh, Frederick. Um, just on on that cheese thing, uh, I know that you know that France is the is the is the home of cheese, for want of a better word. But I'll tell you now, the Philippines is the home of the cheese ice cream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. It's very creative. Yeah. Uh, I, I, well. I absolutely <laughs> remember yeah. uh, having uh, my first cheese ice cream at one of the conferences I, uh, I traveled to in the Philippines some years ago, and it was, it was an experience. Um, there's a comment here. Uh, due to the pandemic, most happenings right now is through the online basis. How can you guarantee that the food that they're buying online is good to the customer. In what way will this food tourism work amidst the pandemic? So I think, you know, if, if we say in connecting back to nature, if that food's no good, I think they, they damage their own brain straight away. Is, mm -hmm. what's, what's your thoughts there? Yeah, uh, one, one thing uh, is absolutely true because we, if we don't have any guarantee, that, that's, that's a concern. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was talking about the, the different terroir and this AOP uh, uh, label, this one guarantees that the, the, the whole uh, food processing follows uh, some, some very strict uh, regulations. So whenever is this type of products, there's absolutely no concerns because it's the same one that is used on, uh, for, for, for retail and, uh, and in restaurants. And I, I, from my experience, I don't, I don't see any uh, breach in food quality because it's still from the same producers. Mm -hmm. It's just the channels of distributions that change. You know, actually, these days, social media, social media takes care of a lot of that, too. If you don't provide a good quality product or service, yeah. they yeah. talk about a social media. So there's more pressure on producers to, to provide quality products. Right. Alan, one more. Alan. I guess I'm, I'm getting a sense, Frederick, that um, whilst the pandemic's around, whilst we've got mobility issues, travel issues and so on, um, it seems to me that a strategy that, that should be being adopted by industry uh, is, is this one of uh, mobilizing domestic tourism, you know, really start mobilizing the people in that country, start mobilizing the, the villages and the communities and getting them to start. Uh, that's how you'll kickstart the food tourism industry. Absolutely. And, and actually, it was a kind of eye-opener for many uh, rural destinations, uh, domestic destinations that were always thinking of themselves in a very almost negative way thinking they would never be able to attract tourists because we were so isolated or without any, any assets. And actually now they realize they have everything because they have often nature, a, a nice pristine environment and they can, and it's not very complicated 
to, to switch to, to host uh, tourists. The, the only issue that might happen in the future if it becomes too popular would be over tourism because right. most of regions like that are very limited carrying capacity. So it's, it's also a, a way to balance this uh, uh, interest towards uh, rural destinations by not being totally overwhelmed by the flow of tourists. Otherwise, that would be very quick to damage the, the place. Very good. Right. And let me just throw the last question in there, Andy, if you don't mind. The word gastronomic is not common to lots of people from around the world. So uh, there's a question there around, give them a very simple way of understanding what gastronomic is. Do you have a simple explanation of gastronomic, the word? Uh, Andy, uh... No, oh, no, no, it's yourself, yourself, sorry, Frederick. Okay, 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 sorry, sorry. 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 Uh, okay, gastronomy actually is just a, a more complex word for, for food. Mm. So that's why I use gastronomic brackets, food, food because it's the same. It's just, it's just uh, an adjective that sounds more sexy, I would say. <laughs> and it's, it's exactly the same. Huh? It's, it's, uh, it's, about, it's all about food, gastronomy. Yeah. It's, it's the Greek word for food, actually. Yeah, good, good, good marketing ploy. Actually, yeah, yeah, very effective. It sounds a bit more refined. <laughs> <laughs> Fred, Frederick, uh, we want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. Excellent discussion. There were a lot of good questions today. And I think I think our audience uh, appreciated seeing that there are opportunities in the food industry. There's a lot of opportunities. You just have to be a little bit more creative in under today's circumstances. So thank you very much. A uh, round of applause for, for our guest speaker. And thank you very Absolutely. much for joining us today, all the way from France. We, we do appreciate that. Thanks Absolutely. a lot to all of you for your attention as well. It was very enjoyable. Very enjoyable presentation, Frederick. Thank you for, for sharing it with us. And again, and again, uh, uh, with with uh, with Frederick joining us today, we'd like to thank our academic sponsors for for joining us, and all the students that come from all the different schools to join us for today's presentation. Uh, we look forward to seeing uh, more academic partners in the future. And again, next week. Next week, we have an interesting presentation. We have another guest from Griffin University in Queensland, Australia, uh, Dr. Sarah Gardner, who's going to talk about reimagining tourism for 221 and beyond. You know, that's a topic that we've just we've touched on many times in the past six months. But the interesting part is uh, Dr. Gardner has actually created a micro credential online course. So that is something that they have done at Griffey University, and it'll bring a lot of new ideas for us next week when we join our session next week on November 11th. And let's see, uh, let's see, uh, Alan, maybe you tell one more reminder about the certificate as I put the, I'll put the, the link into the chat room. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Andy. And don't forget to all of our participants this week, as with every week, if you want to get one of our certificates of attendance, please feel free to scan the QR code that's there. Dr. Andy's also putting it in the chat uh, as, we, as we speak. Uh, that will take you off to the survey. Don't, don't forget that when you get onto the survey, please give us all of your information. And most importantly, share with us the top three key learnings from today's program. And um, given that uh, Frederick has, has given us so many different ideas, I'm sure you're gonna have no problems telling us at least three key, key learnings that you're taking from today's show. And following that, uh, we will send out an e-certificate to everybody that, that participates in the survey and answers the question. So take, take part and use, your, use the QR code right now. And again, uh, on behalf of Perry, Dr. Perry Hobson, who had to depart for another, another webinar uh, during our session, we always get a little, sometimes we have challenges with the schedule. Uh, I'm Dr. Andy Nazchuk, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. And Dr. Frederick Bruchon from the in Institute of Paul Bacuse in France. All right, thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, thank you and Alan, and, and also Perry for, for hosting me today. Thank you to, to all the attendees. I, I, I could see some, some questions, unfortunately, I, I can't uh, answer to, to you now, but please drop me an email if you want to continue this conversation. I think there's a lot uh, to, to exchange. I gave you a very much European-centric uh, perspective, but I hope you, you understand that you can really um, expand this, uh, associate these ideas to, to any part of the world, especially in Southeast Asia. And uh, I'll be very happy to, 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 to continue this conversation with you all. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Fantastic. Thanks. Once again, thank you, Frederick, for joining us. And, uh, you know, from myself, uh, Alan in Western Australia, look very much look forward to uh, Dr. Sarah Gardner's presentation next week. 
in the meantime, everybody, keep safe, keep well, and uh, we'll see you next week, 30 Minute Talks. Thank you, everyone. That, 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 that concludes today's program. We'll see you next week. Have a good week. Stay safe. Thank you.